to come to this organization, to come to this chamber here. I am very, very grateful to Sri Ajay Singh and the organizers of this function today. But I am equally privileged that, you have, that I have been asked to deliver a talk, the first talk on Nidaji Subhash Chandra Bose. It's a very onerous honor, I must say. I feel very, very honored and I feel very happy about it that the country needs inspiring personalities from those pages of our history where people could sacrifice their all for the country and could raise above their personal and self-interest. Associations, creativity, it's associating itself in interests beyond the business and trade, beyond the industry and other areas is really very creditable. I was just told and I just heard that it's very good that you're having this thing on you had the commemorative lectures on Swami Vivekanand, uh, pre former President Abdul Kalam, and I know that all these things make a lot of difference. What matters most in this, in this life is not what your body does, not also what you possess, is how your mind works. How, what is the orientation of your mind? What are you doing when you are doing nothing? And that is the people who are imbibed with nationalism, with the sense of dedication to the nation, they are thinking and breathing about what is that they can contribute and what is that they can do. So I again feel very, very happy. Actually, some of the introduction that was given to me makes me totally disqualified to give this lecture. I should be talking about spying, espionage, sabotage and others <laughs> and not a scholarly lecture on about Subhash Chandra Bose. I think there are much better people who are quite uh, much better endowed to really contribute to his great legacy. Ladies and gentlemen, the many people that this country, the freedom struggle produced, they were the giants of the yesteryears. Their contribution in diverse fields, their personalities and others they had inspired the people and the generations. A sleepy, backward, poor, impoverished country under the slavery for centuries it was no easy task to awaken them. There is no doubt that Subhash both had the genius of which there are very few parallels. He is getting into the ICS and then leaving it, he is getting into becoming a president of the Indian National Congress at the age of 39, 40 and then leaving it at the age of 41. After when, when he was contesting for the second term. So there are many, many outstanding things that in such a short life we left. Um, if, we, if we presume that, well, he did die in 1945, that actually he was only 48 when he died. So he was a young man. And he was a legacy and he did become a history in his own lifetime. Not only in this country, but throughout the world. The amount of connectivity that he was able to get, the long established regimes and the leaders of that time, whether it was Hitler or whether it was going to uh, Japan or it was in Singapore, there was a great this thing. So I don't think that I'm going to talk, and then his scholarly abilities, his intellectual and cerebral qualities are really remar remarkable. There are no other leader who probably in real that terms can really match him. But there are two qualities about Subhash Bose which I think distinguishes him most. While others also had many of the qualities that Subhash Bose had. But Subhash Bose had one thing out of the two things more important than them. Firstly, he had the audacity. He was a very audacious person. He had the audacity, he was seen right when he was in the presidency college and he could take the cuddles with his British uh, principal. He had the audacity to go to London, appear for the ICS and then said, give the, you know, he was ranked very high and then hand over this thing, he said, when he was asked that, well, what will be your biggest 
consideration and importance in life is his my nationalism and then he wrote his resignation letter and came back he had the audacity to challenge gandhi but gandhi was at his prime gandhi had a political career and he was at this thing who was uh, who was a leader for whom probably there was no this thing that when gandhi wanted to support patabi sita ramaiya to be the congress uh, president and subhash bose had an overwhelming support in the majority of the people but then he resigned because he had the reverence for gandhi he said i respect you i don't stand the way he had the audacity that when he came out he started the struggle afresh he was expelled he was over in the congress he had resigned from the congress and then he was jailed and he was still in detention and while in detention in those days he decided that well, let me escape from india so getting into an attire of an afghan quite difficult for a bengali to do that <laughs> he left for kabul the resources the money the every logistics that you require for such ventures is not that easy not easy for a freedom fighter who can nothing to depend on except his own ability his own courage his own conviction and then from here he goes to russia then he found that well russian there was so joined the british in the war so he thought that much of a is can be expected from them so he goes to germany meets hitler but wasn't very comfortable with this policy of uh what some of the this thing that he was doing against uh, the same person and again that there was a distance and others but he did form an india legion there about of the 4000 indian soldiers who had been imprisoned by imprisoned by uh, netaji uh, by the, by hitler he got them released and formed a legion that they will be joining the india's national struggle then comes to japan from there then he comes to the singapore forms the international army see the audacity of a man he must be kept in there uski zagar mein kitna hausla tha main akela hu to kya hua i can make it the real force of my conviction will be able to catapult me to the positions where nobody can even think of you can even dread even thinking of these thoughts probably would be this thing he what Whatever ideas he had, he could live up to them. So that is one great capacity. I am not telling it's good or bad, but I am telling in the Indian history there are very few parallels, or in the global history, where the people have displayed that amount of of an audacity of sailing against the current, and not only the current, it was the current of the great mighty British Empire. And who was with him? no money no resources he had to build everything from his own this even the party that he had and it served well for so many years had made him to resign he reached to its head and abandoned it he said that i will basically the differences had started with the establishment in congress netaji said i will not compromise for anything less than full independence and freedom people in 1928 and others started talking about dominant status people about the states having the elections that you are given some uh, delegated powers and others to the people of india he said it will be total i want this to free this country not only from the political subjugation but their political social economic cultural mindset of the people have got to be changed they should feel like free birds in the sky which gandhi ji thought and his wisdom and maybe it is that probably that is very impractical it cannot be done he felt and he thought that well we can do it and when the second world war started he started up an opportunity has come and he saw in that opportunity that britishers were die, were were fighting the war using the indian soldiers 25 lakh of them
who were fighting for the British, people who died in the war in which they had no stakes. And when in 1945 Bengal suffered a famine in which over 10 lakh people died. And you know why this famine came? Because the British wanted to carry the food strains for the war effort that it was being shipped to Colombo from where to be taken to Europe. Indians were left to die. It is not only the people at the battlefront who are dying, it is the people here who are dying of depravity and persecution. Netaji felt he had seen the world. He was a very, very bright man. He was a much ahead of his stages. That this British army cannot fight. Of 25 lakh Indian soldiers. Tell you have to realize is in the Tidaki Barmati. If you can die for others, for some money, you can die for your own country. And that is how the idea of this thing, which was the, this thing came up. Well, of course, before the, there were some approximate movements also. I think Vijay Mohan Singh had already created something. Ras Bihari Bose in Singapore had collected the people. So when he came, he did get a certain platform. This is the first time. But by and large, he was a loner. By and large, he was a lonely man. He had no resources, he had no money, he had no country that was supporting him to that extent, except Japan, and that also is a very complex story, that what was the relationship of Subhas Bose or the Indian National Army and the Japanese, it was not all that good. There were very, very difficult times. And then he forms the Indian National Army. He left his house on 26th of January and when he came uh, in uh, uh, 1941 and when he formed the Indian National Congress, uh, when he formed the Indian National Army, they were the soldiers who had been imprisoned by the Japanese after they were able to take Singapore and also parts of Malaya. Malaya. So he mobilized them and formed the International Army. Now, in the history of wars, there will be very few conflicts in which you are able to re-motivate those people who had fought, became imprisoned and were in jail, to fight with that ferocity that out of those 30,000, 26,000 never came back never lived. More than 50% of the people perished, or maybe 58, 57% of the people. This attrition rate and the army that was still prepared to fight but for the Japanese who after Hiroshima had to surrender. You need a leader of very extraordinary caliber to lead such people. Leading a winning army is very easy. Even if there are sacrifices, leading a defeated army and people who are scattered all over, coming from different parts of the country, he gave them one this thing which has also become the Indian armies today, one this, that is our Jai Hind. Everybody, whatever your race, clan, religion might be, it is all for Jai Hind. He, way, he never wanted any risk, clans or castes and regions and this thing. He thought India was one. So he named his regiments as Rani Jhasi Regiment or Mahatma Gandhi Regiment or Nehru Brigade and things like that. He gave them the slogan of Ittihad, that is the unity. Amjad, that is the faith. And Kurbani, that is the sacrifice. So every Indian National Army soldier who further, you know, Major Mohan Singh actually who was the first person to have uh, this thing, even before Subhash Chandra Bose came, had thought of this idea and had mobilized the people. But then the Japanese treated him so badly that they believed that. And he had a very uh, difficult this thing. He had three persons he chose to be his generals. 
he had Tokwa Sagal, he had Shanawas Khan, and he had Gulbak Singh Dillon. All of them were outstanding people. So, his legacy is totally unparalleled. But his second quality was his tenacity. It's sometimes very easy to start, but there are many, there are very few people who can slog it to the end. If an idea comes to their mind, and after due diligence, if they decide to walk in that, people may know, people may not know. They may be sleeping, they may be awake, they may be observing, they may not be. But the man is totally steadfast. He sees his goal day in and day out. For him. That is something that he has to carry. So the seed, the idea that came to his mind, I will fight the British. I will not beg for freedom. It is my right. I have to get it. And if I beg for it, it will be conditional, it will have something. India would not have been partitioned if Subhash Bose was there. Jinnah said, I can accept only one leader. That is Subhash Bose. He gave that spirit of an, this in courage and see the poems that were written at that time for the Azad Hindi Forge. When he says, Kadam Kadam Barhaeja. Kushi ke geet gaaye ja, kaum ki hai zindagi, kaum pe lutaaye ja. That's what the fact is about. The life of all is, you are no, you are not immortal. But it's for a purpose. And if you have got that purpose as high and as low key, to die for your motherland, what can be the bigger idea? And all were together in that. Whether it was Hindus or Muslims or Sikhs or any community or any of these things, it was totally indistinguishable. He, he, uh, you know, his leadership was of a different style. There was the doctrine which even Churchill used to say that, well, India is like equator. Everybody knows in the map where it is, but nobody knows on the ground where it is. So if you walk over the equator, you don't know that you're walking over the equator. He says there is nothing as India. India is a, is a, is a, a very uh, uh, ill-defined, Ill it's, it's, it's a concept. There are states and there are communities and there are religions and there are ethnicities and others and that which is what we call it as an Indian. He said no, India was a reality. India is a reality and India will be a reality. It is with this mindset that he traveled his 48 years old journey, lived with that, and what a wonderful journey it was. But a question often comes to the mind. In life, whether your efforts matter or results matter, nobody can doubt about the great efforts. So Gandhi was a great admirer of him. But sometimes people judge you only by the results that you produce. You give your best efforts, but you are not that lucky. Luck was not on your side. But was th so, was this entire effort of Subhash Bose a failure? Was all these his romantic ideas about patriotism, about his great hope and faith and dreams of a great India, were they all something which was only a, a poet's fantasy, which led, led to nothing. I'll tell you one thing. In 1956, you must be knowing, if I will remind you, Clement Attlee was the Prime Minister of UK when the India's Independence Act was signed. 
he is the one who had pleaded that let us give freedom to India. In 1956, his tour was over in 1951, and after that he came on a visit to meet his friends. He came to India, stayed at Raj Bhavan in Calcutta, and uh, forget his name, Justice. Uh, there was a governor there. Um, they had written his name somewhere, but anyway, I don't recall it now. Who was the uh, the, uh, to the governor. So after the dinner talk, the governor asked him, who knew very well because he had studied in England. He said, Clement, you tell me one thing. Gandhi had given up the Bharat Chodo Andolan in 1942 and joined the British in their war effort. So that pressure had gone. You had won the war. So you are the winning and the victorious power. There is no immediate pressure in India for you to vacate. Why did you decide to quit India, the jewel of your, the jewel in the crown? And that too you wanted to leave it overnight. He said, no, we have got a deadline after which we have got to quit, we cannot stay here. You had fought so long and so this thing for 200 years to keep this country enslaved. What happened? I don't know, this is written now, a lot of history books which are this thing and others, it has been now very profusely this thing about that conversation. Even the governor wrote it in his uh, this thing and then came to the newspapers, but we forgot it. That's what I say. History has been very unkind to Nataji. They have not done him justice. So Clement Attlee said, You know it was Netaji Bose. We knew we cannot face him. He said, even if he had died at the time, there was a popular feeling and I don't know what to say about that, but then, that 1945 air crash in uh, Taipei, his land, uh, plane crashed. He says even if he has died, even after his death, we were afraid of the ideas and the nationalism that he had created and many Indians could have gone in that path. When the Indian Army which has revolted or the members of the Indian Army were joined the Indian National Army and the mutiny started, or not if I won't call it mutiny, the freedom this thing started in the Indian Navy and then in the Indian troops in Jabalpur and Karachi, the, wherever naval uh, this thing was there, that it became, we knew, the straws in the wind where they were going to. The memories of 1857 had not evaporated, had not gone away from the psyche. In their memory track even today, what they think was a great decision. He said, today, we have got 25 lakh armed, trained Indian soldiers. If they get involved with the same spirit of 1857, no Britishers will be left alive here. And this is what Bose had done. So we had to leave this thing. Then I think uh, the governor asked him, but then what about Gandhi? And he said, no, that doesn't matter. Now see what he has recorded is this thing. He said, well, at that time he did not matter. It was Bose that we gave independence for. How the history has been unkind and how that person who within his life, I feel very happy that Prime Minister Modi has been somebody who was very keen to resurrect it. I also feel happy that I was associated with it to some extent, wherein India Gate we had the statue of Sivar Chandra Bose, this thing, near the uh, so, uh, near the, the, the war memorial of the Indian Army. That he is the one who is leading it. And be, beyond that is something, all the names of the Indian soldiers who have died in post-independence period. The whole India Gate is the people who died for British. They are the ones who died for India. The new the war mark. The Ross Island in Andaman and Nicobar, in the house where 
Netaji had this thing, had been renamed as Subhas Bose Deep. The 21 islands have been named in Andaman Nicobar on the names of those people who martyred themselves from the Indian different sources. So the whole of the museum has been created in the Red Fort for this thing because it's called to Dilli Chalo because that I want to fly the tricolor, I want to fly the tricolor on the uh, on the Red Fort. And so many other things have been done and this is what we are doing today is a part of it. It's a part of the larger exercise that you are doing to create a new psyche in this country. You only have to change the mindset and the psyche of the people of this country. They can do wonders. Give them an opportunity. Only thing is that we don't know our strengths. We don't know our capabilities. The political philosophy the vision, social thinking of Netaji was far beyond his time. He believed in a very strong India. Say, had he succeeded, what would he have done? He said, my first priority will be to give India a very, very strong war machine. Make India impregnable. I will build its defenses. Unfortunately, up to 62, what we did was that there was an idea should we reduce or disband the army? When the career path had to go and treat with Gandhiji, now we have got independence. Our dushman is The value of a soldier got degraded. Both understood it. He knew that if a nation really has got to be this thing, if India had everything for its long, if it's this thing, a, a better quality of people, more educated, more advanced, better science, better organization, only thing is that it did not have a very strong defense. It did not build its forces. And that's why the Intruders of the Hans, of the Shaks, of the Kushans, of the Mughals, of the Mughals, everybody came here one by one to transcend our over area. And we never learned the lesson. They never undermine your security. Your survival depends on that. It may not be visible in the short term. But when the patch comes, this thing, you crumble like a pack of cards. If you don't have the people, if you don't have the structures, if you don't have the organization, if you don't have the equipment. So Subhas Bush wanted to build a very strong army. Not only that, he said, I would like to have a very strong war industry. Now from 1950 to 1962, if we had started building up this, probably the debacle of 62 might have happened. We were, we were uh, short of equipment, we were short of soldiers, we were short of accessibility to the areas that we had to defend, and we didn't have probably even the proper plan. Anyway, I don't want to go into that, because there are the issues which are not supposed to be spoken to me about in uh, this thing. But the fact is this, we lost the war, for which, because we were not prepared for it. And if a nation is not prepared for a war, if you are not prepared to fight and defend yourself, don't blame the enemy, blame yourself. Only a weak man is the victim. Strong. Nobody just the biggest deterrence is my strength. If I am powerful, if I am strong, there is sufficient deterrence for my enemies to see that I become inviolable. There is some I won't say controversy, but there is some thought that whether uh, Subhash Bose was a leftist, whether he, he, he believed a very, very strong economic destiny of India. He said that I would like, my first priority will be that if, uh, after the political freedom, we want the economic freedom, we want to become economically strong. But he supported this process of planning. He supported the process of 
if I may say, the state sector, the other at that time. Now, the context is not known. The context of that period is, was that everything which was associated with the capitalism at that point of time was intermixed with colonialism. East India Company did not come here as a thing, it came here as a colonial company. And it was responsible for that. Every private sector that was doing, if you wanted it in the, the, the labor for the tea plantations and what, and um, uh, they say, you enslave them and send the, the devoted neighbor to these different places. So it was an exploitative regime. It is much later that as India freed and the role of private capital and the role and their contribution as the patriots of the same who probably in the most important way are contributing to this thing. So he was not something who was against the private sector. He also was something people feel that was probably he was an atheist. He was a highly religious man. He was deeply distinct by Vivekananda and Arvindo. He always carried in this, uh, 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 this uniform and other, uh, the book of Gita with him every time. He, his, uh, the influence of his parents, the influence of Swami Vivekananda and Arvindo and other this thing, and he had purely learned. He had read Vedas, he had read Upanishads, he had read this thing like that. He was a very, very erudite scholar. He was very secular in his outlook. Statecraft and organization and others, he wanted that no old British should be discriminated on the basis of the religion. But deep inside, he was a past and devoted Hindu. He did not make too much of a public display of it. But if you go through his personal this thing and others, well, probably many people will tell you. I don't think that was. I was supposed to do it. Anyway, so he was a person who had this thing. Had he been today or had his legacy this thing, what would he be like India to do? India be like? Gentlemen, he had a great faith in the people of India. He had a great faith in their potential. And today his priority would have been that if now becoming, having become the most populous nation of the world, if we can empower and make these 1.4 billion people, like what used to say the shattering ram or the, or the pather on the plout or something like that, etc. People with energy, people with fire, people in this way, in whatever way of life walk they are, whether you are a soldier on the border or whether you are in the business or in the industry or you are a corporate sector man or you are a professor, wherever you are, whatever you are doing, do it better than what you did it yesterday. Have a fire, think of your country in whatever you are. And I think you are in very unique position. If we can contribute in developing the skills of the people who are working, they are you in your industries. If we can make our labor force today internationally competitive, you know, Today we, are, we have got a workforce of 495 million. China has got it roughly about 850 million. And 2050 we will have the workforce of 1.1 billion. China's workforce will be only 500 million. We will contribute 40% of the global workforce. Prepare and equip them. That is the workforce which are probably that the toddlers, two years old and three years old boy today, will be there at that point of time. Can it be a first rate engineer, a plumber, or a uh, carpenter, or this thing? Whatever he does, can he be globally this thing? You see where India would be. You do not know the contribution of those people who are semi skilled or unskilled and who had gone from here and, and are working in the different parts of the world. Do you know how much they contribute? We have got a contribution of 100. Uh, uh, billion dollars by the people who work in the Middle East who are working in skilled or semi-skilled jobs. It is more than one and a half years budget of the Indian Army. How much they have contributed over the years in building up these countries to say? If you had to build up an economy that can generate that much of a wealth annually, you could, you should, you should have the capacity, capacity of annually spe, uh, invest 2.3 trillion dollars. 
so our biggest strength is our manpower our human resource a strongly nationalist human resource a strongly highly motivated and committed human resource and developing that human this thing in every walk of life if you are a successful businessman be a successful proud indian businessman if you are entrepreneur see that how your entrepreneurship go around the world you are globally competitive our people our companies were going and traversing a different parts of the world they are finding there's a great acceptability for them today people like your enterprise people want your technical skills see whether you can get more and more people encourage more and more people to get into to get globalized we have got the whole world to walk in and walk with there is no antagonism against india and today i think thanks to the last few years of this thing and the prime minister modi ji's leadership and others we are getting very this thing and we are getting in this country the next thing that we have got to conquer are the barriers of technology so we should bring in the technology the critical and emerging technologies the diverse technologies even the smaller uh, this thing everywhere if you have got to be globally competitive you have got to be innovative you have got to be cost effective and you must have the high productivity and if we are if we have to do it we have to invest on our people and you are the people who are interacting and actually working with them so if you want to make the legacy the dream of netaji come true let us once again repose he reposes faith on the people of india who are who are in a very miserable conditions but were still prepared to fight and he could mobilize them to fight against them and bring the indian this indian troops from there to myanmar from there and he conquered actually he had his rule he had his provisional government for three months the uh, today manipur he had his this thing that is uh, he, he uh, there was a government of the indian national of the uh, what was it was known as the, the provisional government of the india and that was the first provisional government of india that was all so if he could in life if you could turn this dive scripts into the great explosive of these things is it that something that we can do our industry can do our business can do unite together in by the spirit of nationalism and patriotism and everywhere that they go thank you very much for giving me this support thank you hope you like the video before leaving leave your comments in the comment section and do not forget to like and subscribe to our channel thank you thanks for watching